Welcome, everybody, to another episode of The Water Cooler. And I am Pumla Schmidt, also known as Exchange Goddess on the Twitters. And today I'm joined by two new friends and Patrick, an old friend. Uh, we've got Todd and Paul here today. And we are going to talk about patch management. And do you patch? Don't you patch? What do you patch? Do you really need the patch? All those fun questions. Uh, before we start, since we do have two new friends, uh, Todd and Paul, do you guys want to give a quick intro of yourselves so we kind of have an idea of what your background is? Sure. Um, we don't, you know, we don't assume that you know you're the uh, backup tape operator, dude, in the data center. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Todd, I'm a uh, basically a consultant for IT consultant, basically working in the Windows stack and usually do Windows uh, deployments. Uh, tenure Microsoft MVP in sort of the desktop and deployment stuff from. I think it was 2009 to 2019. So, yeah. Yeah. So, this is Paul from NetP Pro. Um, I started my IT career in 1990. Um, we were putting together, I'm, I'm trying to remember what it's called, uh, but it was some really old technology on 386 computers. So, it was like terribly old. Uh, fast forward the last 11 years, I started 11 years ago, I started NetP Pro. And I've been a business owner, um, and now we, we take care of a lot of small to medium-sized businesses, some some enterprises that need assist. So we're kind of all over the market with what we do and where we work. Awesome. When you said 1990, I was thinking, wow, I was still in middle school. <laughs> Like wow, nineteen ninety. Wow. Yeah. Well, and then I was I graduated. That's great, 80, though. It's I graduated. Changing. Yeah. No, I graduated high school in eighty seven, and then you know went into the army, and from the army went into technical school for electronics, and got an internship. And so I'm I'm a big believer in internships. I think I've gotten over thirty interns over the years, or more, and launched their careers into IT. So. Yeah, I, that's how that's how I feel. I give back is by get, getting more people into this environment and doing IT. I don't know why. I mean, I share the madness. The best way I can say, it it definitely is a madness. Um, yeah, no, it it hasn't. The industry itself has changed so much, and I'd say the last ten years probably the most. It, it like we have jumped from here. I mean, it's like wow, the the stuff that we were dealing with ten years ago you know, wasn't really even around. And it's funny because I tell my kids, I'm like, voicemail. We used to have these little machines, answering machines with little tapes and stuff. And they're like, what the heck was that? Like, we, um, I still have a landline phone. And so they do see that and they see like this little box thing, but they, you know, to tell them that there was a tape and then also, you know, cassette players in general for music. And I used to record music off the radio and that's like completely foreign to them. So yeah, t technology has really, really changed. Uh, and on the topic of patch management, I think that in itself has changed too. Cause back when I first started, you only really patched if you really needed to, right? Uh, like I, I remember my uh, first IT manager, he said, well, if it's not broken, you don't need to fix it. So, kind of just you know went along now desktop patches we would patch but like servers and uh especially networking equipment switches routers uh it was like yeah it's not broken so let's not touch it we don't want to break it even more but i, I think a lot of that has really changed now Humla, do you think a lot of that change is that it used to be that Patches were patches and upgrades were upgrades, but increasingly they've come, they've become blended where patches include so many new features that they're effectively get a, a necessary action to get the most out of your, your licensing, or is it something different? I think it's a little bit of both. Hmm? I, I think that that line is, is almost crossed over and it's gray now, right? Because uh, a, a lot of software, the patches that are pushed out, like you said, has features now. So if you don't patch, you're not going to get those features. And if you're paying for it, well, you're just wasting money then if you're not, you know, patching because you're not getting those features, but you're still paying for that license and you're paying for the features they're not using. So 
what's the point then? I mean, I'd like to hear your thoughts, Todd or Paul, on that because you do work with a lot of customers. Yeah, so I've got customers that kind of have a mix mixed bag. So um, some customers of mine, most of my customers almost all patch because uh, it's I work in the government space. So government is very much on top of security patching and whatnot. Um, most of the time, the feature updates, they tend to lag behind quite a bit. Um, I'm working with a lot of customers who right now are probably on 1709. Um, sort of some of them are getting up to 1909. I would say none of them are on the 20. Um, h1 or h2 versions yet so they seem to lag about a year or so behind uh everybody else with where they're at with the features but i mean next month i think microsoft's pushing in their quality updates the old edge is going to be uninstalled and the new edge is coming in so it's kind of going to be a, like a feature patch as well because you're going to get going to get that new version of uh, chromium edge and that's sort of causing some anxiety with my customers as well it causes anxiety with me yeah, I, I deployed 20 H2 or whatever, the latest and greatest. I mean, we've taken a maybe a kind of a more unique approach for our patch management in our industry. Most managed services use tools, have set dates for deployment and, you know, automate a ton of that stuff that that has to happen. I've just taken the, you know, this is a great opportunity for us to get eyes and hands on all my customers environment so we manually patch all the servers um now, do, just, you, do you have like a maintenance window like a, like a pre-scheduled time yeah. i know in previous environments it was like every you know uh once a month on the saturday right that's where we did all our server patching uh Except for that one time, our senior director decided to patch our domain controllers on a Tuesday night. But that's <laughs> <laughs> day two of the new job. Okay. Day two. Day two, and you're like, oh, domain controllers reboot, and then and then you find out that the senior director is patching your domain controllers to help your team out. Yeah, he's trying to be helpful. So yeah, we we do it on you know the the very next Saturday after Patch Tuesday. Um, we deploy it during the week in our environment to make sure nothing really bad is happening, you know, and then if it is, hopefully we get it straightened out by that Saturday. And if not, then it gets delayed. Um, but so on you're the giving yourself a week? No, not even a week. It's, it's five days, four or five days. Um, but, you know, one we have one customer that has said they want it on – the Tuesday we, so we do it the Tuesday after. So that's actually a week later and they want it done during the day. Cause they're broadcast. They do um, their radio station and they don't want anything to affect their 5 AM broadcast because that's where they make their money. Uh -huh. And so, so we patch at three o'clock in the afternoon. That's actually really nice. <laughs> you don't, you don't get that too often. So do you, do you find that customers are, not afraid of testing those patches because like when you said five days like wow that's pretty quick I, I know from previous jobs we always did it either two weeks or a month but i wasn't sure like you know i've to be honest with you i've, I've been out of that space now um for two and a half years yeah i mean there's so many i'm just curious to see if customers are still like hesitant but then with all these breaches that we're having, you know, and security um, risk. It's it's almost like you've got to patch that day because there's so many vulnerabilities out there. Right, right. Well, we, we like I said, we don't patch that day, but we, we patch it as soon as it's, you know, tolerable by the customer. Um, and, and, you know, when you go further, you know, network equipment, we do only yearly. Um, VMware, we only do, you know, <laughs> 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 you know, when it's like a, a critical, you know, exploit has been coming down. Um, I, I think I wrote an article on why I run. Uh, this is not a VMware show, but I. Uh, you can. I'm, I, yeah, I ran VMware as well. And so I, we, we run VMware because it just requires a lot less patching than Hyper-V yeah. does. So and I, I wrote up an article focusing on the the cost aspects of what it costs to patch every month compared to patching 
just quarterly with with VMware. So that's just kind of my take is is it can be financial, it can be logical. There's many reasons to space out your patching. We, um, but yeah, I, we, with with the radio station, I I we they many times they won't let us patch anything at any time, so we have to harden everything around it, okay. and just let things run for oh easy a year or two before they even let us patch anything, and it has to be scheduled way in advance, and they can cancel at any moment. So we have both extremes where we can dictate how we patch to our customers. And we also have another set of customers that are dictating to us. And we're like, this is just terrible practice, terrible reasoning, but they just don't want the, the downtime of patching. Yeah, I see that. Oh, sorry. No, I, gonna, I, I see that too, right? Like with my customers, some customers where they'll have laboratory stuff running and you run patches and you're pushing them out and the machine auto reboots that causes absolute chaos and you know you might have a day's worth of testing that's ran and oh machine rate boots and it totally wipes out uh, uh any of that tests that were going on so it's important to we have to kind of coordinate with some of the customers we it's more of a white glove or boots on the ground okay we'll send a text in to go visit the customer find out when it's get, get schedules and I actually have somebody go and basically walk through patch the machines manually so they have workstations um and then other ones we just do okay it's it's n plus three you're getting updates this group after seven days you're getting the updates and if everything's good everybody else gets some n plus 14 kind of thing two weeks out workstations mass mass push and away you go so yeah go ahead patrick I, you're about to say something well, well I, I you know uh uh both todd and paul really hit on something which was if you're patching a server you can deal with the political uh, ramifications of setting a maintenance window. And then based on technology and need, you decide when you're going to patch it usually. Right. But it, it's sort of, it seems like the, the concept of patching is around the idea of you're just patching one thing. And a lot of times you're told like, Hey, you need to patch this without thinking about um, either what the effects are going to be across siloed teams, or especially where you get that uh, cascade of, technology dependencies. The database has to be upgraded before the application has to be upgraded. So I was gonna ask you guys, like how often do you see that? What's that ratio between when there's a delay or when you can't patch when you want to, how often is it that there's a business reason or just a reluctance as a decision versus there's a whole bunch of other platform upgrades that have to happen first, or maybe they have a particular upgrade schedule that you kind of have to wait and then hook into. Yeah, I'll let Todd take that one. Yeah, I've got a bit of both where, you know, I've got some customers that are running, the applications can't be, uh, the applications have to be patched first. Some of the stuff is lab equipment. They, version of Windows, oh, it's Windows 7 still. Uh, well, what we need to run Windows 10. Sorry, we don't, we, we're not, it, the stuff doesn't work. We're still working on coming up with an upgrade. So those customers might have ESU and uh, are still running, running that. Um, or we'll see, okay, we're, We've, we're, we're certified on this version of Windows 10. So let's say, for example, uh, 1703. And it's it's not certified for anything beyond. So you got to make sure that machine is pinned to sort of that version of Windows 10. Can't do a quality uh, feature update until uh, the, the the vendor says, yep, it's good now. Go ahead. You can upgrade. So, yeah, I do have a, I do have a lot of a fair number of uh, machines. I wouldn't say a lot. It's probably maybe, in, you know, depending on the customer and, and what they're doing, like the scientific customers, you definitely see that more, where it's more office uh, space related customers, you don't see that very often. Um, but yeah, def definitely, I do I do encounter that, you know, a fair amount. Yeah, the manufacturing industry is huge on, you know, they have machines that are tied, you know, set up for that laser cutter or that whatever plasma cutter, whatever they have that machine set up to do. And the vendor won't let you update it or do anything. So sometimes we put firewalls in front of them, you know, do what we can to reduce the risk and because they are outdated equipment and it costs the customer millions of dollars to replace the piece of equipment that's tied to that computer. So it's a cost thing. It was, we, we see a lot of pushback, especially in the manufacturing. Yeah, healthcare too. I'm finding out, um, or I've, I've found out, 
just from previous work experiences, uh, I mean, AS400 still runs a lot of medical records, uh, payroll systems. It's usually, you know, some piece of software that's on someone's desk under you know, underneath their desk that's running payroll that they access once a year. And um, for some reason, you know, it could still be running Windows 95. I mean, uh, there was actually a, I remember encountering a system like that in Minnesota, one of our, one of our uh, sites that had a, an old machine that was some type of payroll app that they were running. And it was old. And I got this, uh, one of our uh, techs said, Hey, do you think we can P to V this? And I was like, I can try. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I could see what I can do. Um, but yeah, it was just running le something legacy and upgrading it just wasn't feasible at the time. So it was basically um, protected. <laughs> yeah. Someone, someone says, what's that little occasional table over there in the office? You're like, that's an AS400 that, that actually is running. <laughs> Yeah, you know, th this payroll machine, it was running Windows 95, and it was protected like it, you know, like it was God. It was like, don't don't touch that machine, don't look at it. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it was, but they couldn't upgrade that particular, and it, um, at the, I think they had to wait like two or three years. And by the time I, I had already left then, but yeah, you encounter issues like that, especially, um, in the manufacturing space, healthcare, but I see it more in manufacturing than anything. Yeah, I, we got a customer, they run an IBM I, that's what they call the AS400 now is IBM I. So. <laughs> the fancy so, name, come on you, let's all, it, let's all yeah. be real, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's AS400 code, but yeah. they're, they're calling it IBM I. So yeah, you, you have legacy systems that that that's the bigger risk than on patching to me is the legacy stuff. And and I have a, I have a few friends and obviously we all probably do in security and, you know, IOT devices, you know, with oh God. an IOT yeah. device. That's a whole that, nother water cooler. Okay. 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 We'll get back to we patching a little bit, but I'm just saying in general, like those IOT devices, uh, they're just, but, well, yeah, yeah because, because nobody, nobody's patching them. Nobody's monitoring them. That's the big question. It's like, you know, I, I'm a big, uh, Mr. Robot, um, um, follower, you know, the, the whole series and, you know, how he hacked the temperature system in order to get into the security solution because he, you know, he hacked the temperature monitoring solution because it's attached to the network. It's a network device. You know, so that's so, that's all part of your patching. It can't be, you know, people focus on Windows because there's because Microsoft is putting out patches all the time because they're seeing vulnerabilities. It does so much, but there's a lot of other devices that should be patched that many organizations are ignoring altogether, is my point. So if we're talking about patching, you know, you should really look at the whole gambit. I mean, yeah. one of the things, you know, one of my guys do is big on ubiquity, big ubiquity does exactly what you're talking about. They combine the update with features at the same time. So you have to deploy the updates in order to get the features, in order to keep it secure, and then things break. And it's 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 figuring out when to deploy the, those features and why and how often is acceptable to your organization. You know, I, I told my guy, I'm like, hey, you can do it on Monday night because Tuesday, Tuesday mornings are usually a lot quieter. Don't don't deploy patches on network gear on a weekend. You know. Oh, that yeah, because you know nothing go ever goes wrong. <laughs> nothing ever goes wrong with a patch. You know, systems don't hang. You don't have to go dispatch a tech and power cycle a unit. You know, I mean, you know, granted, a lot of times, you know, you can put smart UPSs in so you can power cycle things remotely. But, you know, not everybody has that luxury. You know, we have a few customers with what they call WADA boxes. So you can remote into that box, power cycle, just a, an outlet to kickstart, you know, the ability of, you know, why is that system hung? You know, 
because the patch didn't apply correctly and a reboot and reapply it and it works. It's like, what? Why didn't it work the first time? What about um, the patch that needs to fix the patch? Yes, the printer patch that just came <laughs> from Microsoft. We could talk about that one. That was blue screening computers. Yes, that one was fantastic. I think there were there was one there was a a Cisco patch too that did some damage to some devices uh, a few years ago. The patch that broke um, a patch to fix the patch. Do you, do you does everyone find that network patching is really fundamentally different, or is it similar to server patching? And by that I mean. If you, I, mean, I think we all get notifications when IT is going to do a major upgrade of, let's say, the core, right? They need to because it's possible. You, you assume that nothing's going to break, but you don't know, right? And so for networking, I mean, do you see cases where a lot of times Cisco may say, hey, here's a vulnerability, but they'll also then have mitigation steps around it to sort of give an option to give you a little bit more time to decide instead of with a, a server where instead it's like, hey, you just need to apply this now, or does it seem to be about the same for everyone? Yeah, for networking, I, I think, like you said, it's it's a lot less often, but a lot more, a lot, lot bigger of a deal, especially if it's core equipment. Um, that's not, you know, even if it's set up in redundancy, because it could hang at some point, you're, 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 you're rebooting no matter what to, for apply to apply that. So you're taking people down, you know, and a lot of it is, could be your core infrastructure. So you need to schedule an outage and you need to get top management to say yes. And, you know, sometimes it's pulling teeth because top management is like, well, we can't go down this weekend. We can't go down that weekend. We can't. It's like, uh, you know, I, when I worked for Compellent, I mean, I, I was deployed a few times to upgrade systems and they'd be like, okay, you can do it between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, I love I love those maintenance windows. I'm like, okay, okay. You're gonna do the most critical tasks when I'm the sleepiest. Because I normally sleep at night. I'm I don't know. I'm just silly that way. <laughs> most of us do, uh, but I, I'm I'm right there with you on those odd hours. And back yeah. up for running. Yeah. So, so w when I started my own company, you know, I just raised my rates to a ridiculous amount. I had a customer who's like, we want you on site from that 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. I said, well, it's going to be $250 an hour, minimum four hours. And they said, okay. I'm like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should value my sleep, sleep a little bit higher than that next time is what I thought. So do you – like – previous lives, we always had redundancy with our hardware, right? So that we could, in theory, be able to patch in the middle of the day. Uh, and to be honest, the only systems that I was able to patch in the middle of the day was Exchange. Because I've, I had four databases, I had spread them across uh, multiple data centers. So, you know, I could literally, and, and I did times at times that patch my exchange servers in the middle of the day because I had that redundancy built into it, that high availability where the users didn't, you know, they didn't know and it, and it wasn't impacting. And if, you know, something happened to one of the servers uh, during that patching, we would, you know, we would find out and we still had other databases running. So could providing more redundancy and high availability with hardware help with like network pat patching our network devices. I know with servers, it's, it's a little different because you know, you're dealing with the applications inside that server or running on that server. You, you can, I mean, when I worked for a school board, we used to do patch the VM host during the day. So we'd move everything off to a different host, but you know, vMotion it. Yeah. Do what we had to do there, then run the, run the upgrade on the host reboot it, it was good, okay, let's bring machines back. Okay, let's bring some other machines over to it. We'll do another host. And we kind of went along one one to one. It was a long process, but it worked. Same with uh, some of the access points we had, uh, I think it was Aruba gear then. And if we had to upgrade some access points, we, we could bring one access point down, the other ones around it. As long as it was architected well enough and there was enough um, coverage, we could, we could upgrade, we could do some of that stuff during the day. Core switches, I don't think we touched during the day just because it's too core. 
it's yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah it's, even it's after the they're redundant, people are too yeah. afraid yeah. of what ifs. Yeah, so. I think I, I I was always nervous too when our networking guys were doing the core switches. We always did them on um, our approved maintenance time. Yeah. I the that one, yeah, I could definitely like. It's the core. It's the core switch, right? Yeah, we had some stuff that only came in onto one onto one core. So I think there was a couple of remote connections that came in. They came in on one Cisco. It only had one one network port. So it was pick a core. That you wanted to plug this thing into so you knew if one of them went down it was going down with it so yeah um, and, you know you, you, not everything was completely completely redundant when it came to the core so but I, I, re I remember patching um esxi host during the day because like you said yeah. you could just v motion them off and yeah put them in a different node and you know you get your work done but <laughs> you always run that risk of uh if you are not properly sized and, and, and some organizations would do that right where we're, we're going to size to run but we're not going to size to run so that just in case we lose nodes yeah. um one host can manage all those vms uh I've, I've seen situations like that and i've actually been asked to oh you know let's reduce some you know, your design here, because technically you're only running at 50%. I'm like, ah, but I, I want to stay here. <laughs> I, I don't want to go over in the event that, you know, I've got a host that goes down. I could, you know, take that load on without impacting performance on the rest of the environment. But uh, I do see a lot of organizations um, wanting to cut corners a little bit because ultimately it saves dollars, right? Does Cloud make some of that easier or let me rephrase that is a part is that a big part of what maybe drives adoption where if you can temporarily get whatever resources you need where before you would have been constrained with the esi esi esx um i instances that you had or at least the hardware to host it um is it easier or is the passion challenge pretty much the same if you still have to manually patch those servers i think if you move to if you move to the cloud, it depends on what type of cloud service, right? So if you if you go to a SaaS application um, or even PaaS, you're not dealing with that backend stuff. You're just dealing with that particular service. You know, the updating is all on your service provider, wh whoever, you know, whatever service that you're um, paying for. Like the, the M, the M and managed. Yeah. So that I think helps, but then you also kind of have to be on the edge a little bit, right? Like your business has to be comfortable knowing that, okay, like office 365, for instance, new features are, are pushed out, right? It, it, it's no one's asking for approval for anything, but things are, you know, things are released. Um, sure. It's same way with like Salesforce and, you know, a lot of these other SaaS apps where, um, Things are things are updated, but it, it I mean, and to me, it does take that pressure off because that's part of the contract that you sign when you went on to this venture of saying, okay, I want to use Office 365 or whatever SaaS application or PaaS. So is it and you don't have to patch or is not patching one of the big drivers for adopting SaaS? I think it's I, I I don't say it's a big driver, but I think it ha to me, I think there there's some. It adds to it, right? Because now you don't have to deal with that. It's one additional overhead that you are removing. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like Office three sixty five, you don't have to deal with you know four or five Exchange servers. You're not patching Exchange and Windows anymore you don't do anything. You're just managing the email environment rather than, and, and, and you, know, and, and, you know, like, do I have the right, you know, see you down and then testing it. That, that, that takes that. I don't want to say it removes a position, but it does reduce the workload onto an exchange admin and a server admin, because some organizations, your exchange team may not actually manage those servers. It, it may be a shared responsibility with the server team 
Um, and, and in fact, my last job was like that until I took over the, the role of leading that team. And I'm like, you guys are exchange dudes. You need to understand the server that the application is running on. You can't just let everything go to the, the server team. You know, if there's something wrong with, you know, let's say exchange is running slow, take a look at the event logs. Don't rely on the server team to do that. This is simple stuff. Uh, you know, and I, I really pushed for it. And by the time I left, they were, you know, fully responsible for their servers. And, and we took a lot off the server team. They would thank me for it. I'm like, but being an exchange admin, you have to know that server beyond the application. You have to understand how that server is running from, from a Windows perspective. Uh, and, and I feel, you know, other applications should do that too, to, to a point is understanding your whole environment from a holistic view of it. You know, understanding what what AV that you're, you know, the security is installing on your server and what exceptions, you know, the AV process is running. Because if there's no exceptions put in, yeah. you could you could kill your app, especially performance on it, if it's scanning certain files. I've I've seen that before. So you really have to understand that that whole picture of your environment. And then when you take when you take that back end out, when you go to SAS or PaaS, because you know there's SQL, there's managed SQL instances in, in Azure and you know there's or just um, SQL databases that you can, you know, run spin up. It, it's the same thing, but you're not dealing with the server portion that that you know the Windows portion that's running it. And it, it takes it takes a, a lot of work. And then you can do other stuff, right? <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes it feels like we're we're getting out of the business of patching by going to managed services, cloud managed services, or even hyper-converged on-prem. And then then you look at the kind of the way that patching is changing now, where now there's a lot of uh, FOSS and cloud native components, and that you know you're using you're you're still using all those managed services, but now you've you know re-implemented your application, and you still have now custom elements that are really different from the kind of upgrades that we used to do, right? Like widely distributed, orchestrated components. And there you're still in that kind of, it's not exactly a hybrid, but you, you, you go from, okay, I don't have to manage the paths, but now I've built an application with new components and lots more of them that still have to be upgraded. Um, Todd, yeah. do you, you see those, right? Or uh, Not as much. I mean, most of my stuff is still old school. Um on-site, on-prem uh, type deployments. Not a whole lot of uh, in the cloud type stuff. I mean, I got a couple customers that were starting to move that way where it's we're using pass. Okay, we want, you want WordPress? You're just gonna spin up a WordPress instance in Azure and we're not gonna worry about the back end stuff. You can, some, somebody's gotta manage it. It just won't be us. It's gonna be somebody else doing that. Um, so yeah, I, but, but for the most part, most of my stuff is still, my customers are all pretty much on-prem doing, doing the on-prem thing. Just to, just starting to tap into the cloud-based stuff now. Yeah, I, I agree a lot with Fuma, Fuma, what she said about all that uh, part being pushed off onto the hosting provider, but you still have a lot of the management, you know, not just the you know, moves, ads, and changes of users, but you have monitoring what they're doing. You know, what, you know, I get these notifications from, 365, like we're going to turn on this feature on this day. If you don't want this feature, you better hit stop. You better change your policy so your end users don't get this. So, you know, yes, we have less of the day-to-day -day responsibility, but more it's more of a traffic controller responsibility of what do we want to let our end users do and what, you know, what features do we turn on or what features are we being forced to turn on you know, which a lot of a lot of them are, are excellent. You know, multi-factor, you know, registering a device. You know, just all these good things that are being forced upon us. You can that, say if they're bad. You can say it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, mean, I have opinions too. I think something the, the security some piece. Turn it, on, it, I'm like, oh, it, that it, wasn't good. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when they turn on Groove or something crazy like that, you know, you're kind of like, uh, I, people are, are having a hard time with chat. You know, so you tell, know. Me, tell me about it. Tell me. 
Yeah. You know, teams has been fantastic. We've embraced the heck out of teams. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we, we do some training for our end, you know, for our customers on teams, trying to get them to understand what the power is beyond that. It's just a chat feature because you can embed so much more into it, you know, streams and planner and all that mm -hmm. other wonderful tools that are just, you know, can be melded together into a very cohesive solution. So uh, we, we, we've embraced the, the whole Office 365 solution set and we ended up luckily mutually separating from one customer that had an on-prem exchange server. And, you know, just before the whole, you know, incident that happened because i it's somebody else's problem really what it comes down to for me now so i don't have to worry about it yeah that 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 whole issue i have feels on that like uh yes definitely so can i ask stay, you a stay, question stay up, and i stay up to I, date and, but at the same time it, i i've i've got a lot of internal feelings on that whole situation Sure. And, and see, somebody explained to me, and I, you can tell me if it's true or not, you know, um, deploying patches onto hosted solution takes a lot longer for programmers to get right because they have so many other variables they have to take in consideration versus on-prem or, you know, uh, software as a service, SaaS service, where they know the environment backwards and forwards and they can they have test dev environment all there they can test the patch way a lot quicker so the 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 patching you know developing the patches is a lot faster in a SaaS environment is that true um i think it just really depends on what you're patching for you know um what the vulnerability is what the exact issue is for the most part but yeah so like with office 365 um disclaimer i don't work for the product group <laughs> the the environment is pretty consistent right the, i mean they they uh, they have standards across the whole environment that they, they know what each build is so yes that the, it um i don't want to say it's easier to patch but because there's consistency Oh, we lost Todd because there's consistency across the board on how those deployments have gone. Uh, I'd probably say that's the only reason why it's easier because they know exactly what's on each machine, how it was built. They know the specs uh, with on premises. Yeah, they do have to take into different considerations, but at the same time, it really just depends. So, and, and I know I, it, I hate giving that answer, but it. <laughs> but isn't that the IT answer? Is it starts yeah. with it depends. It it, it really does. Um, gosh, it's an awful answer. It depends. <laughs> well, I've seen that a lot. Um, where you know early it was you're going to move to cloud, and then there was this conversation around containers, and uh, it, you'll just you'll just rebuild your container and just push that out into your, your container service, right? Well, that's effectively DevOps. And the, the technology that's in there is going to be different. And the idea of patching as a developer is very different than it is oh gosh, yeah. for operations, right? And so to just say, oh, you're just going to move to Kubernetes. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. And you'll just push, you'll just push con containers effectively means you're going to push patching either into the realm of a new team or you're going to have to bring awareness of uh, uh, to the point before about complexity and, and new technology and understanding like you now have to understand all a whole host of new technologies and add that to the basic platform to support patching so it sounded easy at first but in practice as usual it depends once operations gets a crack at it right it's like oh, oh, oh actually yeah this is an entirely new angle on patching yeah we lost Todd I not he's patching. Yeah. He's patching. Hey, a patch got him. Oh, yeah, God. It's, it's Wednesday. Yeah. I mean, I, I never dove into any of that Kubernetes, any of the containers, any of that stuff. I was still living in the here and now. 
and didn't understand the future. So I'm like, well, I'm old, so I'll just I'll just stay with the old stuff and and figure that out. And then when I hear, you know, it's like, okay, we can't patch this. We have to just roll a whole new container in order to upgrade the environment. I'm like, what? Okay, this has not been thought through completely. People just rushed to it and said, this is this is awesome. You don't need servers anymore. You just put a container out there and run or, with it. Or I just built this little web service. Um, it's, it's built out of NPM. It's like 150 lines of code. It's nothing, you can upgrade it. And then there's a thousand libraries underneath that, right? So, Patching all of those didn't use, yeah, that's not part of a packaged application. That's not part of a compiled binary of static links. So that adds another new layer of complexity. Yeah, that's that just kind of reminded me of what, what happened to me recently with my WordPress site. I mean, I had apparently eight different packages that all had to be updated because like I said, it was all part of the, functionary library and they're all insecure and oh by the way you were hacked and somebody put some bad code on your site and i'm like i don't manage my site i pay somebody else to manage my website i gave that up way back a long time ago when i did a front page website you know <laughs> that was a long time ago so uh yes we have to patch nearly everything everywhere and including your website which drives me absolutely bonkers and then you know GoDaddy comes along and says we'll monitor that for you but we're not going to alert that that's an extra fee to monitor monitor is one thing alerting is another thing i'm kind of like okay i think i need to i need to switch providers is what i need to do oh monitoring and alerting oh <laughs> that's a whole other show I, I I don't know how long this show is, so I keep on bringing up new topics. No, it's okay. It's we usually go for about an hour, just because um, the conversations are always really good. There's some that people are like, "Oh, we want to stay on." Um, it's about an hour, uh, and we, I mean, like I said before, I went on. It's very it's very casual. So sometimes we do get sidetracked, right, Patrick? <laughs> Patrick's been on many of them. Yeah, it's 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 really fun, and sometimes people come and go. And I mean, I've been a little bit late a couple times before where I had a meeting that ran long before, but um, topics like this Puma, are, are really interesting. And the, the great thing is that the, you know, like Paul, you, you said before, you know, you live in the here and now. Well, I think you and I have been in the here and now about the same amount of time. And, uh, you know, you hear all of these proclamations about new tech that's going to fix this and it's going to fix that. And patching is always one of those things that's, oh, don't worry, we'll just take care of that. And it's and patching with this magic check mark. But would you say now that the here and now in terms of what's on prem, or maybe you've got hybrid, you've got some connected resources, but the bulk of what you're still managing, it's still pretty much the same, right? I mean, there's, there's these new extents that add complexity, but would you say you're still primarily focused on on-prem um, upgrades, packaged applications with a couple of dependencies maybe, and it's not some kind of crazy container-based microservice hairball of, of parts that all have to be wholesale upgraded. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I mean, because we, we that's what we look for is what we're looking, you know, we, we just look for customers, you know, manufacturing their, their cloud, you know, you know, averse is really what I, what I come down to is what I say, you know, I mean, I have some customers that are moving, you know, some application, you know, it's really more hardware as a service is what they're looking for, but their application still rest on site, you know, so if they lose their internet connection, their press doesn't stop running. They get, you know, you got to be able to still get production out, you know, you got to still got to squeeze the oranges or whatever you, you're, you're producing. You still got to do that without the internet. You know, so if you put too much up there and go, okay, you know, let's look at this as a whole. So we're looking for customers that need our services that are kind of more nostalgic, best way to say it, you know, because there are forward looking things, you know, born in the cloud and, and that kind of thing it makes a lot of sense, especially, you know, you know, we've been through this for a year, this whole COVID thing, you know, um, you know, workforce is, is dispersed, 
you know, we're, we're helping businesses um, close offices and move their stuff into uh, a colo that we're helping them put it into. It's just lift and shift. We're not going, Hey, let's just, you know, but, but you're right, you know, for us, because we look for that, but we have a few customers that are moving some applications that are truly, you know, the, the software as a service, you know, that way they're not tied to their on-prem equipment as much anymore. Now, now they can be more dispersed because the many, you know, the, the, the software companies are coming out with it themselves and making it advantageous to make it happen. That's what Microsoft did. I mean, they, they made, you know, email so advantageous. It made no sense to have a hosted exchange server when, when they were doing it so darn, you know, $4 a mailbox. Come on. You can't, you know, it's a no brainer. It, it's a no brainer. Exactly. And, and you get a SharePoint that works. <laughs> and you get a SharePoint that works. Huh. Yes. Yes. We're, oh my we're, God. SharePoint. That, that's a beast in itself. Yeah. We have a SharePoint developer because I mean, it, it's just, it's just, like you said, there, there's so much power in it. So now it's like, okay, how do you unleash the power? Well, you got to get somebody that knows what they're doing and tie the business reasons to automate these solutions within your SharePoint tool. So your SharePoint developer takes care of doing SharePoint upgrades for custom plugins, for example? Because if you have a developer, chances are you may have things that you have to upgrade yourself along with upgrades to O365, right? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> and now, this is where the part where Fumi was talking about, I may learn something. I have to go back and ask um, you know, our developer on you know because we don't do anything on prem you know we're just like if we're building anything new you know let's try and build it in the cloud you know so it can traverse unless like i said it's a manufacturing process that's a little different but so custom, your customization as always is the is the devil when it comes to patches yeah it is oh, the uh, devil when it comes to patches well. i like it's a love and hate relationship for customizations right Oh, you can customize, you can do all this really cool stuff. And then you're like, oh, shit, when you have to patch or do an upgrade, it's awful. And then you have to like document. Oh, oh we don't like documenting. <laughs> That's a whole nother show that we do not, we'll yeah. never get to. Documentation. <laughs> oh my God. Documentation. It's not, a, it's not for you. Okay. <laughs> it's for the next person. It's for somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Documentate, but that's just it though. I mean, the people document, especially if, with the customizations. And then if you don't document, you push an update down, especially if it's a .NET update that happens to be on a SharePoint server, there goes your weekend. Yeah, for sure. Sorry, I had to jump my kids to school. I was to, had to run to school, get my kid. Forgot it was 345. Was I'm like, good. oh, you gotta go. <laughs> That was a quick run. That was, I know. That it's, was it's, impressive. It's uh, it's only it's only uh, what is it? Three miles there and back. So it's not. It, you do it pretty quick, but yeah, it just basically five minutes, two minutes to drive up, two minutes to drive back. So. Were you one nice. of those dad that you opened the car door and you're like, get on it? No, no, I just I pulled up and I knew, I knew the um, the teacher that it was a, a educational assistant that's friends of the family, so she was waiting with them. So I was just like, hey, sorry, I'm running late, you know. And Nathan just shook his head, laughed. So he's like, oh, that's okay. Like yesterday, I was there really early. I was the first person there waiting in line for all the parents that are picking the kids up. So some days I'm early, some days I'm late. It just depends on what I got going on. It, to me, it just makes sense to be late. There's no line. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's true. But he yeah, likes you have no traffic to deal with. Yeah. Well, if you're there really early, too, you don't have no traffic either because you're right at the front. And then you just, he gets in and you're gone. So, yeah. He likes to get home early because he's a, if he gets home early, he can get on. He plays Minecraft or something with the kids. One of those. One of My those daughter does that too. Yeah. So. And Roblox. Yeah. Oh, Roblox. And GTA. No, not that for here. It's all just Minecraft and a little bit of Fortnite, but mostly Minecraft. Yeah. And, mo and, mo and mostly programming. Like he's doing these weird things where they're building stuff to. What's he making? That? An iron farm. So he's got like a zombie and a villager. And the, the villager gets distressed, so it 
it summons a an iron golem. The iron golem forms, but it falls down to a pit, burns, and makes iron and automatically deposits into a safe. Like I have no idea how any of that stuff works, but that's what he does. So it's amazing what these kids are doing. Yeah. Um, when they're essentially coding, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, they become redstone developers. So we 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 have a intern that brought on, and he, he just extremely bright and talented because the you know the the gamification of it so you know he's been training for this kind of his whole life kind of thing so we set him loose on upgrading you know it's like we had this one customer is like been pushing off the seven to ten upgrades you know and they're like hey let's do them you know there's like 30 40 of them to do and in one night he knocks out 17 of them in less than four hours wow well, yes, it is impressive, but you know, three, There's four. There's a story there, isn't there? There's a good story. <laughs> no, it's not a good story. It's not. It's like okay, one, I, I, I faulted myself for not anticipating his, you know, Atari level. You know, people don't even know what Atari is when I say this. Atari level of gamification of just doing this remotely on, you know, so, you know, he has eight screens and fired up all these things that happen all at once. Well, three, four of them, you know, crashed out on him. Not a big deal, but you know, the big deal is the end user the next day walks in. It's like, this isn't working. And, you know, I, unfortunately it was radio station and they're up at five o'clock in the morning doing drive time, you know, on, on, you know, <laughs> and these are disc jockeys, disc jockey, you know, it's like, they can't yeah. get to hamburger prep. Yeah, they like uh, they're calling the broadcast engineer. Broadcast engineer is calling us. And we're all up at five o'clock in the morning, just because he just was a little too aggressive with his deployments, you know. <laughs> but yeah, but you, gotta, it, you really got to be careful with something. Some of those things, like you say, and the young lads, unless you the young the young lads, they'll just go and say, "Oh, I can do this," and. You got that overconfidence. I mean, I remember being young too. And uh, there's sometimes you just overconfident. I can do this. And sometimes you, you get it and it's great. And sometimes it bites you. And more often than not, when you're younger and you got that overconfidence, it tends to bite you a little bit. So be cautious and and uh, it doesn't hurt to, you know, to, to slow it down a little bit. Just slow it down. Yeah. Well, you know. It's like my senior IT director that was helping us out by patching our domain controllers in the middle of the week. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it, it wasn't just patching. He is, was updating is, Internet Explorer. Is that what, is does that what it comes down to? Like if you want to be a really good patcher, you have to have burned your fit your fingers a lot along yes. the way. Is that is that just a requirement? Is that you have several stories and that's how you get to being competent at doing up, uh, upgrades and patches? You've got to earn the you have to earn those badges. Yeah, you can't teach experience. That's what no. it always comes down to. You you have to go through some of the fire in order yeah, to know what's hot. I, I I personally feel you guys shed some tears to that. You, you got you gotta feel that CIO walking down your cube, you know, pacing back and forth, going, When's this system gonna be up? You mm -hmm. you gotta go through that because uh that builds character. I hate saying it, but it does. It makes a really thick skin, but it also ensures that you're able to handle those types of situations uh, successfully after going through it once, hopefully not twice, sometimes twice, but after going through your, you know, the next time it happens, you're, you're able to get through it without breaking a sweat or minimal sweat required. Um, and then, you know, you learn from those experiences. I, I know, I've done some things that, you know, I wish I hadn't, but I'm glad I did because it, it, it taught me a lot, um, especially in the beginning. You know, I did some things hastily and that taught me patience and, and double checking things. And I'm really big on double. I'm, I always double check. I get, you know, a second opinion like, hey, just double check my work because we all fat finger things. We, we all do. Uh, yeah, it, it, and that comes with experience. You, you, you gotta, you gotta go through it. So, with your CIO walking, pacing the hall behind you, waiting, 
Um, and Paul, Todd, I'm interested to your opinion here. How much of patching is technical prowess and how much of it is good communication? Uh, it's probably almost 50-50. Yeah. Um, if not even more on the communication side, because really the patching is, I mean, you've got now patching solutions, WSUS, Intune, SEC, whatever, right? You've got there's solutions that do that and handle a lot of that management of when, when the patch is going to be pushed on, when the machine is going to reboot. But it's uh, still a communication with the user. Like, you know, it's nothing to flood the help desk. Hey, my machine rebooted in the middle of the day, or it's, re you know, it's rebooted at this time. If you're not communicating, saying, hey, it's Patch Tuesday. And even if a lot of times you'll send those out and people will totally ignore them. But when they call the desk, you can say, hey, yeah, it's Patch Tuesday. We sent the email. All right. And the user will walk away and it's like, okay, I should have paid attention to that. But if you don't communicate that, but if you don't communicate that, then you're kind of on the hook for not having done that and not communicating that. So you're the one that wears it because you know, their machine rebooted when they were doing something that they wanted to do. I always believe when we're, when you're doing a type of upgrade patching, you know, always over communicate because like you said, they didn't read that email. <laughs> yep. So signs on a door, the whole affect nine yards. You know, there's two doors, put a sign on each door. So they, when they come in, they see the note, big letters, you know, this is what's going on. Communication, you know. I was talking to an admin one time and their sales team was like super sensitive to any kind of an outage. And they would of course immediately all get on the phone if anything, you know, dropped out for a second. And so they actually put up those, uh, L, you know, old school LED red scroll bar, uh, scroll boards on two walls in their office so that when they were making a major change or like, let's say they were gonna mic they were gonna V motion a bunch of stuff off to upgrade a, a, a platform server, they would actually put up what was that maintenance notification on that scrolling board so that the first thing that they, they trained them, they're like, if you see something wrong, don't call the help desk until you look up and look at the board first. And that cut the number of tickets by about 90%. Well, guys, we are just about out of time. Final thoughts for the day. It is Wednesday. Um, I feel like it's Wednesday. Is it Friday yet? <laughs> it's Wednesday again in March. <laughs> yeah. If 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 uh, if everything was awesome and you had a test environment and you could deploy your patches. And and then test them before you actually deploy them for real. I mean, I mean, if we were wish we we're wishing for things that we could have, you know, those most are people don't have that though. No, correct. Most people do not have that. No. Identical environments are 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 hard to come by. It, it's resources, right? It's money. Right. It is resources. It is money, and you know you. But if you if you work with programming teams, they have a test dev environment. They have, you know, they have lobbied and gotten the money, you know. And to me, you know, how much do they want these to be guaranteed to work every time? And you know, it's like, well, if if they're beating you up, go back and beat them up and get, yeah. go get and say, well, in order for me to do it the way you want me to do it, I need all this dev environment in order to do testing of these patches on this environment to make it work. And then they'll shut up, you know, cause they won't come up with, you know, they may come up with the money and then you'll, you'll have all this extra equipment, you know, and now that's more, even more work cause you're now patching twice, but now you're guaranteed cause you'll know it works. Yeah. So. I, I always, uh, that's one of the things with new projects, get a test and, or a, uh, a dev environment that you can, uh, test in for patches and whatnot. Todd, any final thoughts, Patrick, before we say goodbye for... Uh, uh, I made a joke the other day that if anything derails AI ops, it's going to be patching and communication around it. Um, but the... Uh, yeah, I think the com complexity is continuing to increase. Patching doesn't go away. And it really ends up being sort of Success increasingly is around two, two main ideas. The first one is that not every patch is the same. And so learning how to evaluate criticality of patches, especially for overlapping reasons. Is it governance? Is it features? Is it, I have to now do a bunch of detective work to determine whether there's 
enough in what should be a, a small upgrade, but it actually has a lot that my team needs. So that aspect of trying to really spend more time analyzing whether and how to prioritize patching is important. And then the last one is communication determines whether you can get critical patches out or not, whether you can get the business to sign off on a small hit to availability maybe in the middle of the day, but that offers a lot of return or hits um, security or other uh, requirements later. So yeah, I mean, absolutely you have to burn your fingers a lot of times, but increasingly communication and real analysis of the value of different patches seems to be paying a bigger uh, dividend to, to teams that are faced with a lot of different upgrades. That sounds good. I, like I say, for me, patching is really just a, it's a monthly event, especially with the Microsoft stuff. My customers just do it because that's their, in, in the space that they're in, they have to be patching. So they're, it's a basically a regulatory requirement. So whether they whether they want to take them or not, they have to. So it's just it's a little bit easier that way because, you know, with, with your end users, you're not having to, you know, you still have to communicate, but you're not having to say why we're doing it. It's They know why. It's just one of those things they have to deal with. It's a necessary evil, right? Yeah, it yeah. is. No, it's good that they know they need to do it. Okay, everyone. Um, thank you again, Paul, Todd, and Patrick Thanks. for joining today. This was a good conversation. I know patching is just it's a touchy subject, right? Everybody hates doing it, but we got to do it. Until the next uh, water cooler, everybody have a great Wednesday, the rest of your week. Uh, and, and hopefully, you know, spring will be here fast enough <laughs> thanks everyone have a great day yep thanks bye. for having me bye